We now bring the Tuesday, June 12, 2018 Upper Arlington uh, Board of Education meeting to order. Mr. Geisfeld, will you call the roll? Mr. Kenzie? Here. Mr. Grease? Here. Mrs. Comfort? Here. Mrs. Royer? Here. And Mrs. Moore? Here. Are there any additions to the agenda? None. No. We have uh, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Mr. Geisel? Mrs. Comfort? Aye. Mrs. Royer? Aye. Mr. McKenzie? Aye. Mrs. Dries? Aye. Mrs. Moore? Aye. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. I call for approval of the minutes. Hi. Now, communications to the board. Do we have the co-presidents of the Upper Arlington Education Association? Not here, sorry. Okay. Um, Moving on, uh, Superintendent Imhoff, we have a safety audit presentation. Great, thanks a lot. Well, good evening. Uh, for the board members, I put a monitor right down here in front too, so you don't have to kind of turn and see the screen, so that way everyone can see what's going on. Uh, so we're starting tonight with the safety presentation, and just in way of a review, um, when you all directed me to conduct a full-scale safety audit in February, um, I know you were very clear about safety has to be about everything, top to bottom, back to front. Um, and it has to be about more than just an active shooter. I know that that's what's in the news oftentimes when it comes to school safety, but when we talk about school safety, uh, obviously we have to talk about everything. Um, and one of the things you also made clear to me is if we're truly gonna focus on safety and make it our number one priority, which I know it is for you, uh, the most important thing we have to focus on is the well-being of our students and staff. And so we'll be talking about that a considerable amount tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, both our police chief and fire chief are with us tonight, Chief, uh, uh, chief Knopfinger and Chief Hahn, uh, and I just want to stop and thank them for their service to our community. <laughs> our safety audit was completed by a company called Safeguard Risk Solutions in partnership with our very own Upper Arlington Police and Fire. Uh, and in all, as all of us know, we're very blessed to have excellent police and fire departments here uh, in UA. Um, I wanna say in beginning, if any one of us believes that any one of the items we're gonna talk about tonight is gonna make us safe, I think we're mistaken. This has to be a holistic approach to safety and it has to be an everyday approach to safety. I wanna thank the Board of Education for your commitment to, to safety and the well and, and the well-being of our kids, uh, this is not a new commitment. So you first had a safety audit done in 2013, about five years ago. Uh, after that, I know there were meetings in all the buildings with staff and with parents, and from that point forward, there has been uh, a big focus on safety, many many drills, and a lot of preparation. Uh, one of the things that was new for this year was our first town hall meeting on safety and you were all there and that happened in February which was very well attended and you've committed to having uh, one of those each and every year. As we move into the safety audit re uh, report and I know you all know this but many parts of the actual report that we receive 
um, many, many parts of that are going to remain confidential uh, for, uh, uh, for security purposes, just so everyone here knows the Board of Education had a meeting in executive session in May. Uh, where they met with our police chief and, and, and fire chief uh, and the representative from the safety company. And so the Board of Education knows every aspect of the safety audit. Um, also, I met individually with every member of the Board of Education uh, over the past week just to share, uh, obviously, with each of you what I was going to be recommending uh, tonight. So this is not the first time that you all are seeing about this, seeing this tonight. So as we talk about the plan, I'm going to start with a discussion on the well-being of our students. Um, you all have made it very, very clear to me that that has to be the foundation of any plan. So, uh, and we're going to talk about later this evening, the planning process for the next iteration of our, our strategic plan. As a school district, we have a very long history of being guided by a series of plans that are well-written, focused, uh, and measurable. And so it is time to begin the planning process for our next plan that's going to occur next uh, next year. And again, we're, we're going to talk about that later in the meeting. But uh, I know that you have already directed that one of our three areas of focus in that plan is going to be the well-being of our students, meaning that moving forward is going to be one of the three major areas that we focus on as a school district. And this includes, but it is, but, 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 but it's not limited to all those things you see on your screen. So we do talk about the mental health of our kids, about safety, about the prevention of bullying, cultural competency, substance abuse prevention, student stress, their, their health. And let me just be clear. Um, I have talked to a lot of parents in the last several weeks. Uh, and one of the things I know, and I know you know, but I want to make sure everyone here knows that you know and we know we have a lot of work to do every school district does we are not hiding from that we are not claiming that we have got all of this nailed and things are perfect we acknowledge we have a lot of work to do in this area and we are committed to getting it done for our kids so i'm going to move into recommendations now um, and again i just want to remind everyone that i'm talking about the recommendations for safety that we're going to publicly share. Obviously, the board knows I'm not talking about every one of the, of, of, of the recommendations. There are also a number of these recommendations where I'm going to talk about broadly, but I'm not going to go into specifics again because some of the parts of this we're not going to share publicly for safety uh, reasons. Um, I just want to thank again the partnership with the city, um, and I think that has just been a key uh, in this whole process. So I'm going to start again. The first recommendation is around the well-being of our students. You're going to hear me say again and again tonight, that has to be the foundation. And I don't think we can talk about that enough. Uh, while I've talked to many parents over the last weeks and many parents with a lot of different opinions uh, on the topic of lunch, uh, one of the things that everyone agreed upon uh, was we have to focus on the well-being of our students. Uh, and I did not have anyone who, who uh, disagreed with that, and uh, I certainly could, could, could not uh, disagree with that, and I'm very happy about that. So the first recommendation beyond that I'm going to talk about is identification cards for our kids. One of the things from, from the safety audit that became very clear, and we know this, um, as a school district, we are accountable for the kids, clearly. And that means we have to know who is in our building when. Who is here and, and, and who is not here? And so we have to have an effective way to track that. And so one of the recommendations is to research new student ID card systems that can be used for attendance tracking so we always know who is in the building and who is not in the building. And so we're going to be researching different products on the market, and we are committing to coming back to you by February of 19 with a recommendation about what system to implement for the fall of next school uh, school year and that is the first a recommendation about id cards the next recommendation is about visitor protocol um, i'm really proud at the uh, at the changes we have made in this area um, when it comes to volunteers as you know all of our volunteers have to go through a background check and they get a badge and they have been uh, very, very, very patient with that because all of our parents and grandparents understand the importance of safety. 
Uh, all the contractors who work in our buildings, and there will be more and more of those coming soon, obviously, also have to go through full background checks before they're allowed on our sites. But the area that came out in the audit that is not where it should be yet is how we handle just general day-to-day -day visitors to the building. And so the recommendation was to put in place a system where when you come visit the building, you scan your driver's license or your state-issued ID card, and that'll run a background check, and then that prints out a visitor badge that also has a picture of the visitor on it. And so there are a number of those different products on the market, and so we are committed uh, to researching which one is the best fit for us. We've, well, we will have a recommendation to you as the Board of Education no later than February of 19 for implementation for the fall of, this, of, of next school year. The next area I want to talk about are our school resource officers. Um, as you all know, a number of years ago, we added our first SRO here at the high school. Uh, that is a member of the Upper Arlington Police Department that has been jointly funded by the City of, of Upper Arlington and the schools. Um, I will tell you that that has gone very, very well. Uh, safety experts agree that it is uh, important to have an, an officer in the school. Uh, but the thing that we have been really pleased with beyond that is the positive impact on culture. It's been another adult in the building that many of our students uh, have taken the time to get to know and confide in and talk to when there are situations going on, sometimes that, that they don't know quite to handle. Uh, and so it's just been a great for us. In fact, it's been so good uh, that as you know, uh, at the beginning of the school year that just finished, you actually approved adding a second SRO in the school district that has been shared between our two middle schools. And so the recommendation in this report is to add two more SROs. Uh, the, 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 the first addition will mean that we do not have to share at the middle schools. There will be an SRO at each middle school. And, and the other addition uh, is going to be an SRO that will float amongst the, the elementary schools. Uh, the other thing I want to mention uh, that we put in place uh, in the second part of this year, uh, the, the, the senior door here at the high school, which is right over here, uh, which is unlocked during the day because obviously kids are coming and going for, for a number of reasons. Uh, we actually have hired a special duty police officer and that's a rotating assignment. So we always have a police officer at that door since we have to keep it un unlocked for kids to be able to come and go due to lunch and study hall. After hours emergency procedures. This is an area that I'm going to talk about briefly, but I'm not going to share every detail for, uh, for reasons of confidentiality. But this is very important, and this is something that I know we spent a lot of time on. And when I say after hours, I mean after hours and, and, and before hours, anytime school is not in session. And as all of us know, our buildings are being used constantly. And so when we talk about safety, we have to talk about more than just during the school day. How do we keep uh, all of the people using our buildings safe at all times? Um, and so what we're going to talk about publicly is improved training for procedures for people uh, uh, using the buildings, uh, updating our procedures for that. All of this is going to be done in the fall of this year by the start of the school year. I will tell you one of the things we are going to begin requiring is people who are using our buildings are going to have to go through safety training. Um, so outside groups who are, who are coming in, uh, those sorts of things are going to need to be trained. And we're also going to need uh, more, uh, more training for our custodial uh, and maintenance folks who are in the buildings after hours too. So it's a lot to do with training, uh, but I'm not going to get in into any more uh, details on that. It does lead me into the next topic though, which is safety training in general. Um, training and drills and being, and being prepared is very important. And as I talk about all these things, I need to keep reminding us all that this is about more than an active shooter. Uh, there are a whole host of things that can happen in a school that we need to be prepared for. Fire and weather events and gas leaks. We've experienced many of those things here at the high school. And so we do have to practice for all of those things to be as safe as we can possibly be. Uh, and so one of the recommendations is um, that we're going to have to have more training and more drills, and the drills are not always going to be able to happen at a convenient time. We have to practice for what happens if there's a situation at a class change, or at lunch, or at recess, or at, at, at arrival or dismissal. If we're really gonna be prepared 
we have to plan for things to happen at times of day that, that, that are not convenient. We're also going to have to have unannounced drills uh, because, again, in order to really prepare, we can't always warn everyone. But a couple of caveats there I want to talk about that I think are very important to parents and I know to you. Especially in the younger grades, we have to do this in a way that is developmentally appropriate because we don't want to cause anxiety in our kids. And so we are going to be uh, working uh, with our police and fire uh, and some healthcare professionals to help us put these things in place in a way um, that is appropriate, especially for our youngest kids. But we also have special needs students throughout our district. And so we have to help them on an individual basis. And so we're going to have to work with our special needs kids one one at a time to, to make sure that we're dealing with them and, and handling these, uh, uh, these issues for them in a way that is appropriate for them. And I know I've already heard from a number of parents of these students who are worried about this, and I understand that, and so we are gonna be working together to make, all, make sure all of this is appropriate uh, for each and every one of our students. Uh, the final uh, recommendation before I get into open lunch is security cameras. Um, I'm gonna be very general here. We, we, we have them in places in the district, I'm not going to say where, and we're going to add more, and I'm not going to say where. Uh, but this is a recommendation to add more, uh, more cameras, and so we are going to begin doing this, and this is going to happen almost immediately, um, and we know that is important. So I'm going to move on now to open lunch, to study hall, and the campus policy changes. Um, and before I talk specifically about that, and I know uh, everyone has read the, uh, the, 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 the recommendation, um, I want to make some general comments about open lunch. Um, I know this has been a big discussion in our community over the last weeks and months, and, uh, and so I want to add some comments here. First, I want to say that the issue of open or closed lunch did not come up because of parent complaints. Um, I asked our safety ex experts and police department to review our policy and to make recommendations based upon safety. I asked for this because I was worried about the safety of open lunch. I also want to be clear that my recommendation about open lunch is based upon my concern for safety in total. Again, this is not just about an active shooter. This is about safety in total. It's bigger than just an active shooter. Now as, all as you, now, as all of you know, a lot of parents have reached out to me and all of you, as well as students. And one of the great things about UA, and I've said this and I will keep saying this again and again and again, is that when people have thoughts, opinions, and passions about things, they reach out and talk to us. And so that is all good. Um, one of the things, though, through all of these conversations, many of these conversations turn quickly to stories. And that is good, and we learn a lot through stories. And uh, I've heard stories uh, about what lunch has meant to kids. I've heard stories about the freedom and the, and, and, and the independence, and just being able to take a break in the middle of the day and what that means to them. I talk about families. I've heard talk about families being able to be together at lunch and just what it has meant. I've heard about the tradition over decades and what this, this, this means to people. But I've heard other stories too. I've heard stories from students that I can't get into to, to details about and from parents about things that, that, that are revolving around lunch that are causing stress in situations that are dangerous. And so one of the things I've learned quickly is you can't make a blanket statement about open lunch. It's not great for every kid. It's not bad for every kid. It, 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 it is different for every student and every family. So it has impacted all of our kids in a different way, and there's not a simple answer to this question of open lunch or closed. Um, one thing I can tell you about open and closed lunch is that the safety experts agree. The safety experts agree and recommend clearly to close lunch. And understand too that they do not say, and I am not saying, this is going to magically keep everyone safe from everything bad. This is one recommendation in a total plan of safety, and we have to look at it as that. This is one aspect and one aspect only. But safety experts agree that the benefits of open lunch 
are outweighed by the risks. And when we make the decisions, I believe we have to look at the benefits versus the risks. And I believe that we have to put safety first and follow the recommendation, again, of our safety experts. I want you to know, and I know you all know, I'm not taking this recommendation lightly tonight. I understand that closing lunch, even over a period of years, is not popular and it's not easy. That has been made clear to, to me. I understand what the students want and I understand what many of the parents want, but I hope the fact that I'm recommending closing lunch anyway illustrates how important I feel this is to the safety of our students. And I feel very, very strongly about that. I wanna circle back to my opening comments on mental health. I understand and parents have made it clear to me and if, I wish you could have heard all the stories I heard that for some open lunch has been that chance to decompress. It really has. And as we talk about the well-being of our students, we have to confront issues of student stress. They are real in this high school and we have to confront them and open lunch is not the magic fix for, 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 for that or, or, or it, it, it's, it's not going to be the thing that, that, that makes that worse. It's just one aspect of it. And we can't pretend that open lunch is gonna fix everything or break everything. Again, we have to look at the whole child and we have to confront student stress and also bullying prevention. I'm getting more and more messages from parents about bullying and we are investigating every case of bullying, but I will tell you, we have to do more. We have to do more. We have to take a stand against bullying and that's the kind of thing that takes our entire community coming together. So again, we can't pretend that opening or closing lunch is gonna magically fix every problem. It is not, it's more complicated than that. But closing lunch, I believe, is an important part of a comprehensive look at safety. So let's walk through the recommendation. I'm gonna start with the elementaries and middle schools. So I'm recommending that lunch be closed for all five of the elementaries in both middle schools beginning this fall. It's important to remember though, that a parent or guardian can always come to school and check out their, 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 their child and take them to lunch or, or take them home to lunch. That, that is always okay and that is always great and we will always support that. Now, as we look to the high school, as you know, I'm recommending a phased in approach at the high school for closed lunch. Um, and I've been asked by this um, already. People have said, well, if you're telling me that you believe that closed lunch is safer, why are you waiting? Why are you not just doing it all at the same time? And the reality is I would rather do it all at the same time and I believe it would be safer, but I have serious concerns about our capacity to make that happen. Um, Parents have talked to me and we talked to our staff here and in, in, in the food service uh, area. And quite frankly, in order to do this well, we need time to build our capacity in the area of food service. And so I am recommending that we start with the freshman class of next year, phase it in over time, uh, because we need to build our capacity and identify other, other places to eat as well. Um, the other thing that is very important in this is we have to identify outdoor dining areas. Fresh air is important. Getting, getting, getting out, out of a building is important. And so we are gonna be working uh, with the incoming freshman class because they're, they are the ones who are gonna be impacted by this first. And we're gonna put together a student group uh, and we're gonna talk about outdoor dining areas. We're gonna talk about the food choices and the places where, where we offer food. How do we, how, how, how do we improve our food choices? Uh, what do they want? What are other things we can offer at lunch? Other, other, other activities. So there are op op opportunities for students to, 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 to decompress and participate in other things. And I believe that involving the students in this and giving the students a voice is the best way to get to what is gonna work best for them. And so next year, lunch is closed for freshmen. And then the year after for freshmen and sophomores and then freshmen, sophomores and juniors and then the fall of 2021, it'll be closed for all students, which is also the first year in our new high school. And as you all know, the, 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 the new high school is bigger. It's gonna have plenty of room for different dining options, plenty of, uh, uh, plenty of spaces for kids to go uh, during, uh, during the lunch hour. Uh, and so we're excited about that. 
The other thing I want to work with, though, on this incoming freshman class, the class of 2022, is what can we do for them during their senior year to develop a new tradition at Upper Arlington High School? So there is something that they get or get to do that, 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 that no one else gets. It could be a special area, a senior lounge or cafeteria or area. It could be a number of things. But I want the kids to work to identify what that could be and let them be a part of putting together a, uh, a, a new tradition. So that is open lunch. Now the next area I want to talk about is open study hall for seniors. So we've had open lunch for, uh, for a long, long time. Open study hall for, for, for seniors is more recent. Um, and again, uh, the safety experts have, have, have recommended that we close that because again, this is about students coming and going throughout the day, knowing, knowing where all the, all the students are, being accountable. Um, and so I am recommending that beginning next school, school year, we close study hall for seniors with the exception of seniors who have a study hall either the first or the last period of the day. They can come in late or, or leave early still as a, as a special a benefit for seniors. But I am recommending that we close study halls uh, beginning in the fall of 19. The reason I'm not recommending that in the fall of this year is we've already scheduled the high school and we would have to reschedule the high school. And if you've ever been a high school principal, you know that is not an, an easy thing to do in June. Uh, and so we need time to actually get this right. So with that, I'm gonna move on. I wanna say again, and I feel like I need to say this again and again and again, just because uh, of the passion around this issue. Closing lunch is only one aspect of a comprehensive approach to safety. And the most important part of the safety plan has to be focusing on the well-being of our students. That has to be the, the most important part of this. Um, since I'm recommending the four-year phase in, I wanna remind parents that uh, parents always have the right to opt their students out of, of, of open lunch. Uh, parents at the high school, as we close lunch, always have the right to come and check out their students and take them to lunch, just like at the lower grade levels. But I've also been asked by, by parents over these last weeks, why don't we just make open lunch a parent choice and let the parents decide. The parents who think it's safe can use it, the parents who think it's not safe can close. And again, I'm gonna go back to the recommendation of our safety officials. All of the students coming and going, that, that, that is a part of our safety concern. We, and we do have to be accountable for our students um, and we have to keep the students on site to be as safe as possible. Again, creating outdoor spaces as well, because I know a lot of parents are concerned that we wanna just keep them inside the building and never let them go outside. So that is the conclusion of my report. Um, wanna talk about our next steps. Uh, so obviously you as, as a board are here tonight to listen to our community. I know you're gonna be uh, open to, to hearing from them over the next couple of weeks. Um, and I realize that you're not gonna take action on these recommendations until your meeting on June 27th, which will be at six o'clock here again. We will again communicate that uh, to, to, to all of our uh, parents so they know they have the opportunity to come out uh, and address you again. With that, I'm going to pause and ask uh, if any members of the Board of Education have any questions. And again, I will remind everyone I've met with all the board members about this previously. So does anyone, anyone have any questions? I have a question yes. for um, open study hall for your first period classes. Are the underclassmen allowed to come in at that second period no. time? No. Okay, so right now they do have to come in at first period. And then when we have the late time start uh, for um, the teacher, um, what is it called? Then? Yeah, yeah, the staff development. Office hours? How will that work then? I'll have to get back to you on that. I need to talk to our high school folks about that. Um, and on lunch, you know, I appreciate that you've listened to everybody, Paul, and that you've uh, listen to both sides of the story and I think there are two sides of this and um, I certainly don't think safety is a time of day I think it's all the time um, and I'm anxious to hear what our community has to say any other questions yes um, the 
going to start that in August, even before the school year starts, because we want to start the year well. So, yes. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. We have now reached the first of our two public participation sessions for the meeting. The first session is for comments related to items on tonight's meeting agenda. The second session, which will come a little later in the meeting, will be for general comments. Uh, to register for public participation, you must have filled out one of these green forms before the beginning of the meeting. Each person who's registered will have up to five minutes to address the board. We'll begin by asking you to state your name and address for the record. Please remember that this is a time for the board to hear your thoughts, ideas, and concerns. We will not have a response for you during this meeting, but rather we will direct the appropriate staff member to contact you soon. We have a number of people signed up for, particip for public participation to comment on the agenda from this evening. I'm going to ask for a motion for my fellow board members to suspend our normal guideline that only allows 30 minutes for public participation so that everyone who has signed up will be able to address the board. Um, and the board may elect to take a recess at some point in the evening if needed, but we will stay tonight as long as necessary so everyone can speak. Is there a motion? Mrs. Royer? Aye. Thank you. And could you please call the first person for public participation session number one, Mr. Reisfeld? Kathy Polk. I didn't know I'd get a podium. <laughs> I am Kathy Poltz. My address, did you say you need my address? 1320 Castleton Road North, 43220. Okay. I spoke at a previous board meeting to state my opinion that lunch should stay open, so I won't repeat the reasons for keeping, them, for keeping it open. As this process has developed, I feel that the administration and some of the school board have been wanting to close lunch for a while, but there was not an opportunity. And as they say in politics, never let a crisis go to waste. I also feel that the community is at a disadvantage. The bond levy already passed, so we don't have any leverage to have our voices count. We do vote for school board, and no one currently on the board ever had to state their opinion on open lunch when they were running for office. If I had known that someone did not support open lunch, I'm sorry, but I would not have voted for you. I know that the majority of time, maybe every time, the board supports the administration. I hope in this instance you really take the time to listen to the community, and that is who you serve. In the safety document, I did not see a compelling reason to close lunch, so I hope you please listen to the parents. We don't really live in a bubble, and bad things can happen anytime, anywhere. I want my child to be able to choose what he does for lunch when he comes to the high school next year, so I hope you keep it open. Thanks. Jason Howe. Jason Howe, 3870 Norbrook Drive. I'm concerned about our future here in Upper Arlington Schools. Not just of the well-being of our students, which we heard about, but the anxiety that's gonna be caused with the stress of lunch. I took some notes as we were going along today. Things I heard, well-being of our students. We don't want to cause anxiety for our kids. Safety in total. Mental health decompress. Having a child that has anxiety issues, I know that lunch causes major issues at school. He needs that time to decompress. Sitting in a group on the floor eating, it's unacceptable. If you've been here at high school and you walk around at lunchtime, 
There's kids sitting on the floor. If he doesn't make it to lunch in the first six minutes of, of lunch, he does not get served. How is this going to change when you force all students to come to lunch? How will this change if you say everybody here has to do this? Now, listening and watching the new news and voting for a new school, I'm super excited for. I am not excited to pay for more additional space here in this building. It's going to be torn down. It's going to be removed. It will not be used again. Spending hundreds of thousands of dollars possibly on a new space, that is not what we want. It's not what we voted for. We voted for a fantastic new building half a block away. I would imagine the same experts that said, hey, we should close lunches, or probably be the same experts that say, hey, we should keep all of our students at home and learn school on a book, on the computer. If you think about it, closed lunch does make sense for those experts. Something's going to happen sooner or later. But those are also the same things that give our kids an opportunity to learn, to grow, to make sure they process and understand things do happen in our world constantly. Lunchtime is just another constant. I think that when we go to school, especially high school, it's one of those places we get to learn and grow and meet new people. I know that most of the time, as an adult, we tend to sit with the same people every day at lunch. As kids, they're learning how to meet new people, talk to new people, and see new people. What's good, what's bad, what choices they should make in order to become a better person. Unfortunately, I don't think some of our freshmen ever get the opportunity. They're going to see the same people day in and day out for lunch. They're going to watch upperclassmen walk off campus. That's going to cause anxiety in many of our kids. Sitting there watching their friends that they know drive away in their cars, they go somewhere else while they get to go to the cafeteria, hallways, or stairwells to sit down on the floor to eat. I don't think that's appropriate either. I think that in the future, if we want to have a closed lunch system, we should look at that in our new building. Our building is being built just a half a block away. It's going to be a fantastic facility and will be available for all students to eat lunch there at one time if we plan well. Right now, we don't have the facilities for that. And I darn too, and I don't want to pay for more facilities here when we're going to get rid of it. So the well-being of our students. The experts say that this might not be the best place for our kids to go out for lunch. Well, I don't think that's necessarily fair. I think, I think it's fair for our students that weren't told about this meeting. Look at the attendance here. It's summertime. Of course. Let's take this meeting during summer so our kids can have their voice heard. That's how I feel about that. Thank you for your time. Trisha Kirshner. Hi, I'm Trisha Kirchner, 2527 Brandon Road. First of all, thank you so much for serving for us because it's a hard job being up there and doing all the things you do. Um, so I'm a mother of two. I have a junior and a, a incoming freshman. So now I'm in a really big place because my daughter is going to be going out to lunch and my other one's going to be stuck on the floor. Um, which I know the stories. I mean, Molly's come home and told me, you know, they have to run to the cafeteria to get a spot, or if they don't go outside really quick, they won't get the table in the courtyard, so they have to sit on the ground. I get it, we don't have the space. So what is it, 450 freshmen maybe next year? And I know I checked the walls about the capacity in here and it doesn't fit that, so it's definitely gonna be hard. But I also have a different perspective, and Scott knows. I have taught high school for 24 years in a neighboring district, and in this district we've had closed lunch until next year which is becoming open. Mm -hmm. It is open for seniors, and then they're gonna phase it in for juniors and so on. And the 
reason being is that it's crowded and we're crowded and we're reversing it. So I just think it's something maybe we can talk about. I'm sure you can talk to the superintendent there and see what's going on with that. I know that one of the other high schools opened this year. The high school I teach at will be that next year. We had to have three lunches to accommodate all of the students eating lunch. It's really hard for scheduling. So I know the principal is going to have a really tough time with that because it eliminates electives, which really impacts students. Not having electives available to students to reach, I mean, I took accounting here at this high school and it was one of the most eye-opening courses I ever had. I had a chance to take ceramics and photography and I know kids have room in their schedule, but kids that do orchestra and choir and all of those things limit the nice, um, you know, added electives. And when you add a third lunch, which may be one of the things you're gonna end up having to do, it becomes really stressful on the counselors and the scheduling. So that's just another perspective that I don't know if you've thought about, but has become an issue for us. But I think it is important for parents to be able to decide on this too. I mean, I could write 180 notes saying Kate's going home next year. I mean, I could laminate a something that she shows them every day, or I could come and pick her up, you know, or have her grandma come pick her up so she could go for lunch with her sister while she's still in school. It is a fun, nice thing to do and I get it. Safety is so important. I go to work every day and I'm scared sometimes because I don't know what's going to happen. I send my kids to school every day and I pray for them. So it's really important I think that we really think about what we're doing in both avenues. There's not a clear answer. My husband and I talked about this today and it's like there's, there's a fight either way. But lunch is loud and stressful. And if you've ever been to Jones and I love you Jason, it's loud. <laughs> It's stressful, and I know that, you know, not both of my students, my children, did not enjoy sitting at a table for the time. And great, they have a movie in the cafeteria or in the auditorium, or they have to walk counterclockwise around a gym one direction, no stop, around the, the track, no stopping. It's not the same. It's not the same as forming friendships. And I really appreciated what Jason said when he said that um, you meet new people. I remember going out to lunch with new people and it was so wonderful to have a different perspective and meet new friends. One of the moms commented on a post on the UA discussion forum today, it's really stressful for children when there's 12 seats around a table and you're the 13th kid. And it happens. It happens at Jones. I'm sure it happens at Hastings. And I think it'll happen here and we won't have that flexibility to really meet new people. So, I mean, mental health is an issue. Lunch isn't gonna cure it, I get that. But four more years of middle school lunches sounds so painful. Um, I, can our kids, can our siblings take out our other siblings for lunch or does that not count? Do we know? Paul? He's zoned out on me. All right. Um, so, um, Okay, so that's a really great question to find out. If your sibling is a junior and you're a freshman, can you go out to lunch with your brother or sister? Um, or can you walk home for lunch if your mom calls in? Because I know I've got neighbors that, you know, sometimes they, their kids want to come home and be with them because their parents don't work. You know, or their mom doesn't work. I think that would be amazing instead of having your mommy pick you up. So in my 20 seconds, I think it does teach responsibility. I think it does teach time management. And it does teach real world lessons to become an adult. I know there's safety issues, I get it. But I don't think closing right now, maybe in the new building that would be great. Again, you know, that's just my opinion. But thank you. Kelly Stone. Hi, I'm Kelly Stone and I'm 1165 Highland Drive. Um, I've heard, as Jason said, and many other people have said, we've heard two conflicting arguments here. Safety, which we all know is the main concern, but also here the number one concern is well-being. And um, in here where it says, let's celebrate all individuals. To me, closing lunch does not celebrate all individuals. It, opening lunch celebrates all individuals and let everybody be their own individual. They're not stuck at a table. You talk about peer pressure, you talk about suicides now, you talk about bullying, you talk about all this stuff. The cafeteria is the absolute worst. 
then there could be a teacher in every single corner and it still happens. And you want kids who are feeling bad about themselves, who don't have friends, who are stressed and want to decompress. Kids who have um, special diets, they don't want people to know about their diets. They don't want to pack their lunch every day. They want home cooked meals or they want to go whatever they want to do at lunch. They should be able to do that and not be stuck there and be um, you know, stuck in a place where they, fe they don't feel like an individual. They feel like they, they have no privacy, they're gonna be bullied or, you know, and some people, they enjoy it. Uh, they enjoy being there, but I don't think for everybody and for everybody's well-being, it's a great place um, to keep lunches closed and keep everybody confined in a room sitting on floors now. <laughs> But the other issue is, is that when you talk about the kids going from middle school, I have middle schoolers, I have a senior that just graduated, and I have an up and coming junior. One is a special needs kids, is a special needs child. When you talk about middle school, the biggest thing they talk about is lunch and how horrible lunch is. You can't get away from your friend group. Oh, this person switched their friend group. This person's sitting at this table. This is not, you can't, the stress at lunch is horrible. To put that into high school and to not let people branch out of that, I think it's just is, is horrible and it's not giving anybody any opportunity to meet new people and Arlington's already, it's hard to break out of your friend groups and to actually figure out who you are. Not only that, by making lunches, like you had to go three periods. Big thing is, is like my daughter would come home to get her homework done or to be able to sit in quiet and um, eat and do stuff so that when she did her sports or whatever, after school, she had stuff done. She had time to do it. Um, and she could do it on her own time and it wasn't stressful. It relieved her stress and it, and it did for me too when I, when I was at this school. I didn't tend to go out and whatever you think we do at lunch or if you think they're doing drugs or whatever you think they're doing at open lunch. And I understand the safety issue, but at the same time, you talk about the big thing is kids going, coming and leaving from the school. Well, you say you're getting new ID system. You say that, you know, that accounts where the kids are. If a kid leaves, you're accounting for it if you're spending all this money for this new ID system. So what is it? Is it the safety and knowing where kids are and the coming and going? Because if you have ID systems, you know exactly. They're in the building or they're not in the building. So either it's that issue or it's that you just want to close lunch for, you know, to, to, to corral them all and keep them all there. And I just, I think you really need to listen to the community. You talk about the suicide rate is super high right now. Most of these school shooters are from kids who have mental health and you're gonna throw it in their face every day or kids that maybe you can make, um, you know, break keeping them here. I just don't think it's, I don't think it's the right interest of our community. We're small, you can drive, walk almost anywhere. We've got, play, it's not like all these other schools where they are, they have to drive super far. We don't have to drive very far. You don't even have to walk very far to get food. Not to mention, I wonder what the community impact is on the, the establish, establishments around here that expect the money. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. April Howe, 4115 Ashmore Road. Um, several people have already come up and said a lot of things that I've been thinking and wanting to say too. So I'm just going to pose uh, the questions that were going through my mind during um, Mr. Enhoff's report. So if lunch is to be closed, you say that it can be uh, parents still checking out their, their students. Um, does that mean that parents have to pick their students up? Um, is that when you say parent, is it only a parent? Can a grandparent, an aunt or uncle, an older sibling also be responsible enough to come check the student out? Um, also, uh, the church that we belong to has a very vibrant youth program and the youth leaders from our church right now go to Hastings, Jones, and the high school on a rotating basis and they load kids up into one of the church vans and they um, take the kids out to lunch. This happens uh, once every couple of months. Will that also be able to continue or will those people be allowed to still come and check the student out? Um, several people have already said about the mental health thing, so I won't go into that much more detail, only just to say that being outside being able to leave is very important. Daughter.
Gina Westhoven. Hi, I'm Tina Westhoven, and I live at 3984 Woodbridge. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Wish I didn't know I had five minutes because I spent half the day cutting my speech down. <laughs> so you're in luck. Um, <laughs> I really did. I have two sons in UA schools, a uh, sophomore at high school and an eighth grader. And as their parent, I'm willing to allow my boys to leave school for lunch. My son enjoyed and benefited um, as a freshman, and I want the same for Jack, particularly Jack. Y'all know why, right? <laughs> um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, I helped create a petition in support of keeping lunch open when I heard that there was a very good chance that it was going to close. And within just a few short days, over 900 community members signed that petition. Showed very quickly how strongly many in this community feel about this. I sincerely hope that this school board will not only consider our superintendent's recommendations, and those of the consultants, but that you'll consider the parents, the students, and the community who will be affected by these proposed changes. As the affected parties, we above all deserve to be heard and considered by independent thinkers, that we, the independent thinkers that we elected to serve our community. I recently had the opportunity to discuss open lunch with Paul M. Hoff, and during that meeting, he shared with me that our community had been more outspoken about open lunch than any other issue during his time as superintendent. And I'm not surprised by the community's interest. I think it's indicative of how frustrated that I and many others have, be have become at the direction that our society is moving. The constant changes being implemented that serve a few, but take the freedoms away from many. The reactions and solutions offered to fix things that don't often address what's causing the problems. As a parent, of course I want my kids safe, and I also want them to live their life to the fullest and not operate and make decisions based on fear. I want them to be strong and brave and take chances, and I want them to learn responsibility early. We all take calculated risks every day, in sports, in driving, hell, it's a risk to eat, we could choke. Um, life is full of risks, and you might feel better to think that if we close lunch that no kids will die in an auto accident, but what's going to stop them from dying on their way to school and on the way home from school? Um, if your concern is, is driving safety, and this is not something I necessarily support, just throwing it out there. If that's a big concern, okay, you're not going to stop kids from driving to and from school. You can't because you don't have school buses. But maybe instead of closing lunch, don't let kids drive to lunch. If that's a big deal and a serious safety concern, that's an option versus just taking the open lunch away. Um, if you're concerned with school violence or an active shooter, it can happen anytime. Dismissal time when the entire school is pouring out of basically two or three doors, a sports event, an active shooter, would you rather have all your kids in one location or would you rather have them dispersed at lunch? I would personally not like to have my children like fish in a barrel. That would be my preference. I would feel like they were safer being able to move about. If the concern is knowing where students are, that can easily be addressed through the student IDs, badge readers, the common practice in many schools and workplaces. The children and young adults that have committed these school shootings most often come from broken homes, they face economic uncertainty and have mental illness and are often bullied. So how exactly does your proposal to close lunch address any of those factors? For the most part, those are not things the school could or should have an impact on. You cannot fix broken homes or alleviate economic uncertainty. And it's also not up to the schools to uncover mental illness in our children. That's the job of the parents. Bullying is something that the school may be able to impact, but none of these things are going to go away. They're all part of life. If this proposal to close lunch moves forward, we can be assured that any child that struggles either temporarily or, or permanently with these stresses and traits and pressures um, at the high school. They'll have no escape from these feelings and pressures, and the vast majority of students will attest to this, the value of the option of open lunch. So I think that instead of making our kids safer, that by closing lunch, we may be creating new ticking time bombs. We may be taking away a privilege that may have helped us avoid an awful situation. We have a unique opportunity to make sure our kids have the best possible high school experience as we build a new school. And I'm certain that there are many precautions and security measures that can be implemented without adversely affecting our kids. I'd like to finish by sharing just a couple comments left by signers of our petition. 
first one is a teacher who taught for the high school um, for 30 years. And she says that without hesitation, our open campus policy was the most positive social aspect of student life. Rather than corralling students, we, we allowed them the freedom to behave as responsible young adults, a privilege our community values. A former student wrote, Excuse me, oh, it's your last comment here. Fine. A former student wrote, open lunch helped keep me from stressing out and having a breakdown while I was at school. Glad I got to fit that one in because I think that fits very well with what a lot of people are saying. Thank you. Laura Harold Johnson. Hi. Uh, Laura Harold Johnson. I'm at 2602 Zollinger Road. Uh, thank you for having us and hearing us tonight. Um, I'm a parent of soon to be three kids and teach um, preschool locally, uh, as well as chair the Equity and Diversity Committee at Whitcliffe, co chair the um, committee there. I'm by no means an authority in this area at all, but I have significant concerns about what more police in school means for students and why it is worth the cost over, for instance, more school counselors. I'm concerned about the increasing presence of police in schools with the intent to improve safety. While a necessary presence in the community, children in schools have very different needs and approaches to discipline than um, police training provides. SROs have exacerbated the school to prison pipeline nationally, increasing arrests for students, children, particularly uh, low income students, students of color, and students with disabilities. While I don't have the actual number of arrests locally, um, we do know that Arlington also follows national trends in terms of higher disciplinary rates among students of color thanks to data divided by race and ethnicity. There's no research to attest for the effectiveness of SROs to um, helping school safety while there is data to support the usefulness of mental health professionals in schools. What plans are there to add support and further staff training so that they are better equipped to support students and all their needs? focusing on bullying prevention, positive discipline, restorative justice, and building a community of inclusiveness um, instead of zero tolerance, which often SROs are contributing um, in terms of discipline. If SROs are decided to be added, what guidelines are in place and how are they created? And given that violent situations are very rare, the tendency is for SROs to have other roles. So what other roles do they have in schools and in disciplinary action with students? What training proceeds going into schools to prepare officers for the different needs of students in schools? How is data collected around use of and student interaction with SROs to ensure they're adding to the positive and safe environment schools are trying to create? Having an inclusive and thoughtful process to share guidelines and shape guidelines and continue to work with community is so important and to make sure that we're making a safer school environment for all students. Thank you. Allie Curran. Hi, I'm Allie Curran, um, 2231 Inchcliffe Road. And um, I thought about contacting you all many times on the board individually, and I haven't yet. But what you may or may not know, and, and I've talked to Paul about in previous times, is that um, I take care of children with special needs, particularly autism and mental health disorders, um, interact with the district and other districts quite a bit in the care of those kids. And um, I think that the bigger picture of how we address mental health and wellness is really complicated, and I would love to like help or participate in any further discussions that are longer than five minutes about that. Um, and, and to put that in perspective, I mean, I have children I care for in this community that attend these schools who write the scary letters about shooting people up, okay? Like, those are my patients. And i am also got little kids that I'm saying, like, how do I help prevent them from being that child? What does that look like, both from their medical care, to their IEPs, to their interaction with their peers? And that's a process. I don't think that happens overnight. I don't think that when we talk about safety issues or bullying issues or shooters or any of these things, that those happen overnight. Okay, those children don't just wake up one day and end up like that. 
You know, in every one of these national stories, people are like, oh, we always knew him. We knew he was going to be that guy. And we have to work as a team to be behind those parents who also want that for their kids. And what does that look like? And I think that um, I, I would love to participate more in those discussions. In regards to open lunch, I, I agree with a lot of what everybody says here, um, both as a provider to those children and as a mother. Um, you know, my daughter's been through a lot of this high school. Some things have been fantastic and some things have not been fantastic. And when things were bad, home for lunch was a big deal. Whether that was remembering to come home and changing for her golf match or putting on her cheerleading uniform or taking some medicine because she felt bad or taking a rest or getting a break. It was a big deal. Open lunch was a big deal. But I also think that we're going the entire wrong way with our scheduling in, as a whole. All the research and data and forward progress, we talk about building a school and a community for the future. We are not trapping people in lecture halls all day. That's not what we're doing. When I went to medical school, I literally sat in a lecture hall while the teachers changed for eight hours a day. But the medical students now, they don't. They're on webinars and in small groups and they're in and out of campus and they are not in a room. And, and I feel like this is going exactly the opposite way of what education is doing. You know, these kids should be on open campuses, meaning like block scheduling, downtime, sitting in those new beautiful common areas we're building in groups and working on things. Nobody has an attention span to be in there for all day, eight hours. All the data indicates it. Every data we have says children, sh people should not be sitting in a lecture style environment all day long. And so for me, it's not just about open lunch. It's like, what are we doing as we try to lock our children in into this environment? I mean, my daughter doesn't study until nine o'clock at night. You know, she wants to do good on her AP Gov test, right? Nine o'clock at night is not the best time to be studying for AP Gov, just so all of you know. If that's not so great, it's no fun. Um, they need downtime in the daylight hours to study. You know, they need time where they can take what that teacher told them and sit and process it and work on it. And so I feel like we're, we should be transitioning to more free time, not more structured time. And so open lunch for me is at that bigger picture of like, that's just one time. I mean, we have kids that schedule their study hall with lunch so they have a two hour lunch. Um, you know, my daughter would take her golf team of all freshmen out for lunch. It was a great bonding time. You know, and, that, and a lot of teams do that. The upperclassmen reach down because the freshmen don't have cars. Let's all go to lunch. Um, there's many different layers of this. So, um, and my daughter, to end with it, is coming in as a freshman. Three years of a lockdown in this building seems terrible to me. So, I hope you all can think about that. Matt Burkhart. Good evening, Matt Burkhart, 2174 McCoy Road. Um, I appreciate the hard work and hard choices that have gone into the, uh, both the audit report and the recommendations. As with most things, there's a spectrum of choices uh, for each of these issues, and it becomes an issue of line drawing and balancing uh, to where do we come out on any particular one. Certainly not every recommendation that a safety expert would make is being recommended in the recommendations tonight. There are certainly things that would increase a student's safety here at the high school uh, that a police officer, or chief of police would recommend that are not being recommended to you for approval. So then the issue again is, well, where do we draw the line? What recommendations do we implement and what do we not? Um, I'm gonna go off the reservation briefly here and address uh, a non-lunch related issue. Um, and as I review the recommendations, and with looking at the SRO recommendations, um, what caught my eye is that there was that there was that there is to be a single SRO to rotate among five elementary schools. And to me, that seems inadequate. And I would encourage the board to explore options that would have an armed individual at each of the elementary schools um, rather than rotating um, one individual among five schools. Uh, would yield them, you know, a school one, 
day a week, uh, which you would really have to look out for that SRO to have an impact on any particular event. Um, and going back to lunch just briefly, as I mentioned before, it's really an issue of line drawing. Um, and as I reviewed the report and the various recommendations, including the ID pass and the visitor protocol that were are being suggested to be really beefed up, um, it seems that the same concerns that spawned those recommendations are the concerns that spawn the recommendation to close lunch. And so if in response to traffic in and out and knowing who's in the building, if those concerns on a general level can be addressed uh, with an ID program and a beefed up visitor policy, um, it seems to me that necessarily uh, those same issues and those same recommendations can be uh, used to address the open lunch concerns because they really are, at least as presented in the report, uh, those are the same concerns, and so it seems to me that either you have an adequate visitor program, an adequate ID program that would address those concerns, or you don't. And so if you do have that program in place, then necessarily, at least as presented in the report, uh, the concerns about open lunch are addressed as well. Thank you very much for your time. Carolyn Casper. Bishop Lord. Hi, Bishop Lord, uh, 3810 Walhaven Road. Um, there's been quite a bit of debate as to the effectiveness of uh, school resource officers with regards to school safety. Um, what is statistically proven, however, is that uh, SROs frequently end up criminalizing normal child behavior and that minorities and kids with developmental disabilities are without question just disproportionately targeted by SROs. Uh, it's being proposed that the number of SROs is to in be increased uh, specifically, the board is considering introducing an element to the criminal justice system into the elementary schools uh, and age uh, the district and UAPD wholly lack experience in dealing with in that capacity. Uh, this in one of the least diverse districts in the region with at last check about 14% of the kids on an IEP. I would like to ask what specific plan will UA schools have in place to prevent our schools from becoming a stop on the school to prison pipeline who in the district or on a campus is the ultimate arbiter as to whether or not an arrest is made and charges are filed against the student? What specific written enforceable policies will be in place to protect the civil rights of the district's minority students and a larger group of those with developmental disabilities or are on an IEP? And finally, if the concern is truly student well-being, and this isn't in a reactionary measure, why is the proposal to spend operating capital on additional SROs without a proposal for hiring additional social workers or behaviorists? Thank you. Lisa Copeland. Lisa Copley, it's 3420 Stonehenge Court, it's 43221. Um, a lot of things have been said, I'm not gonna reiterate all those. I think the, the main thing I wanna say is I think the timing of this has been swift and quiet. Um, I think that choosing to do this in the fall without a real plan in place for these incoming freshmen that are truly gonna live through three years of chaos and immediately shutting down lunch without a plan is, I think it's poor choice. I mean, I'm just gonna be honest. Um, you know, even sitting outside, which I'm not trying to wrap my head around how, how exactly you guys think that's going to look if you aren't securing the building, how are they getting outside? Are all these safety measures gonna be in place in the fall? Because it doesn't sound like that we have a plan in place because the recommendation for the IDs is gonna be in February of 19. Um, I think that it's, I think it's going to be difficult. And then, you know, these, this freshman class that even going outside, I mean, I think you can think about the noise level that's going to be on this campus for the next three years while we build a building that is completely adjacent to where they're going to be having school. 
Um, so I think that the timing, you know, I can't speak to open lunch. I don't have anybody here yet. I have an incoming freshman, but I didn't personally have open lunch, but I just think the timing of this has been poor. Um, who is going to make the decisions uh, with this advisory board that we're doing of this freshman class? Can anyone participate? Like, how, what does that look like? And I just don't think that this has all been properly thought out and that there's a plan in place that people are all aware of. And I just think that the timing of it has been fast. So, but. Judy Trexler. Hi, my name is Jeannie Trexler, live at 2282 Fishinger Road. I've raised a daughter in the school, she is out and about. I have a son in high school. I work at Greensview Elementary School. So I speak as a parent and I speak as a worker in the school. I'm an education assistant. So my concerns for open lunch, I'm going to be the, the one here that says something entirely different from what you've heard. Um, I see open lunch as an opportunity for anybody to come onto the school property, into the school, and we don't know who they are. Doors are open, strangers are welcome. And not having a police officer at every school puts that burden of security on your education assistants who are with the children. 450 plus children depending on what school you're talking about and we are talking about building new schools and having construction and strangers that will be on the premises so not having a police officer and leaving that up to your education assistants is I feel like that may be a liability um, for the safety of our children so that whole open concept kind of makes me think. Um, in terms of the high school setting, I know the kids want to be free. I know that we want the open campus concept, uh, junior college kind of feel, and they love it. But um, it hits me very personally here that my daughter, who I have no contact with, came into this high school as a very high honor student went into sports, um, varsity lettered her freshman year in cross country, and I have no contact with her now because she learned how to drink and do drugs during open lunch at this high school. And I'm not blaming the high school for this, but I was working and her father works and no one was home. And it wasn't our home that she went to, but it was anybody else's home where there was no parent. So we basically have lost her, and we're praying the best for our son who is in this high school right now. Praise God, he's doing fine, and he loves school. Um, I know that he goes out during lunch, but I don't feel like he's taking the same walk as his sister did, because the pain was too hard for him to witness at home. Um, in terms of maybe possibilities we can do, I don't know when we're talking about having closed lunch, if the students are allowed on the campus here outside at tables. I don't know if that's permissible if we close lunch. Um, if that is allowed and the students are against cafeteria food or packing lunches, I mean, maybe an option is bringing food trucks. Kids love food trucks, <laughs> you know? haul up a couple food trucks and I bet the kids would be more than willing to hang out here and, you know, sign them up for tacos, whatever, I don't know, veggie burgers, but, um, but that's something to think about. Um, my son will tell you that he has a lot of friends that go home at lunch and get high, go to the friend's house that has the booze and no parents, um, grabs a Starbucks on the way back sometimes taints it up a little bit, and they're good to go for the rest of the afternoon. 
he also informed me that UA stands for underage alcoholics. And I'm like, okay. That was new to me and shocking. Um, the other issue with the open lunch that I see, and we talked about siblings getting in cars with upperclassmen or whatnot. I know that when you get your license here, by law, I believe you're allowed to have one family member for a certain amount of time and then so many in a car. Um, that law doesn't apply to our kids when they're going out at lunch. They are piling in as many as they can get in a car and they are going. So that doesn't apply. Um, they're just trying to beat the clock and piling in in the cars. I live on Fishinger Road. I see them flying by. Um, something to think about, Columbine had open lunch and they still had that problem during lunchtime. The shooters came in, maybe it would have been, if it weren't open lunch, maybe it would have been spotted better, I don't know. But my girlfriend, my very good friend, her students, her two sons were in Columbine when that happened. So, pardon? Okay. So, anyway, just bringing it up. Thank you. Elizabeth uh, Dills. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Dills, 1842 Arlington Avenue, 43212. Um, I don't really have a prepared statement, and I think people have pretty much said everything that. Uh, that I would say, um, I, my youngest is a senior. We've had a fabulous experience at this school. I love this school, I love this school district. I also have always been very, very proud of the fact that we do have an open campus. We have open lunch and we have open study hall for our seniors. Um, so really torn about this because I think this is such a great opportunity. And unfortunately, I just met some freshmen, incoming freshman girls who are here and attending the meeting because I really feel sorry for them, but they're not going to have that experience that some of our kids have been able to have being in the school. Um, one quick thing that hasn't been mentioned I want to bring up, I know we talked about seniors having first period open study hall, last period open study hall. I know for some students who are in sports, they don't take advantage of that first and last period because they have to be here before school. My daughter was a swimmer, so she was here at five in the morning and stayed until about 6.30 at night. So she would take advantage of that study hall in the middle of the day to come home and take a break. So now you know where I'm going with that uh, part of the story and that, that break during the middle of the day was very important to her. So just keep in mind that that first period, last period doesn't necessarily always work for seniors um, to take advantage of the open campus as well. So thank you. Good evening, I'm Wallow Zello, 2519 Cranford Road. Um, hey, thank you guys. Thank you guys for all you do for our community, our students. Thank you so for listening so diligently tonight to all of us. Um, you, you, thank you, Paul, for the study. Um, this is a great study. I like to specifically speak about the open lunch, go figure. Um, I gotta be honest, listening to all the comments tonight, listening to the presentation, reading the material, you don't have this figured out. You don't know where you're gonna feed these kids. You don't know how you're gonna feed them. Um, you don't know how you're gonna help them decompress. You don't have the outside eating places figured out. You don't have this figured out. And being somebody who worked at a restaurant company for 18 years, you need time to figure this out. Two to three months ain't gonna cut it. You need time to figure this out. If there's one thing the administration, the school board has shown us is that when you take your time to figure things out, when you reach out to the community, get their input, talk to teachers, talk to the students, talk to former students, get everybody's input, wonderful things can happen just like you did with the school designs and school project and school levy that you just did. Don't rush this. This is too important to rush. Take your time. I ask the school board that on June 27th, the action you take on this recommendation 
is to postpone it. Ask the administration to take the next six months to figure this out and figure it out in the right way. Um, give it time. Thank you. I'd like to uh, entertain motion for a five minute recess. Comfort. Hi, this is Kenzie. Hi, Drees. Hi. This is Roy. Good morning.